Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back a little prior to 9-11. I'm going to take you back to 1983 when I met Andy. Um, so I'm six foot one and Andy is six, was six foot five. And we met at Heartbreaks in the city. I was in the phone booth calling my mother to tell her I was on my way home. It was a little after midnight. And of course our eyes connect. He's coming out of the men's room. And I'm like, oh my God, he's tall and he's cute. I want to go out with that one. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got home at about 5.30 in the morning and my mother was ready to kill me. There were no cell phones back then. So it was not, uh, it was not, um, it was not a good meeting for her. For me, on the other hand, it was probably the best day of my life because um, I dated Andy through college. I was a junior in college, so I finished dating him. And when I graduated, um, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Now, most people that are in their early 20s that have a boyfriend, or I should say many people, I shouldn't say most, um, most guys might not stick around under those circumstances, not knowing what the future was going to hold. But he was a treasure. He was one of the nicest, kindest men you could ever meet. So fast forward, I went through chemotherapy. I had surgery. I was okay. We got married. Um, went on to have two healthy, beautiful twin sons, Mike and Dan. And, you know, we you know, set out to uh, basically start our storybook life. And at the time we were living in the city, we moved out to the suburbs, we bought a house. I had a career at the time I was working with, first with IBM for about 10 years. And then I switched into um, finance in the financial world and I was working for what's now Bank of America. And uh, Andy had worked in Midtown his whole life for a very small, um, he was an institutional sales trader and he worked um, uh, over by Rockefeller Center. Anyway, uh, about May of 2001, his company got bought out by Bank of New York. And it was a very hard transition for Andy because he had only worked for a company that had 60 employees. And all of a sudden he was in the middle of corporate America and it, it didn't go well. So he ended up leaving his job that he had had for over 20 years. And he spent the summer playing golf and getting his handicap down to about a nine. And he was, you know, basically a pig in shit. <laughs> and I, who was going to work every day said, you know, you kind of, you should really start thinking about what you want to do and blah, blah, blah. So started interviewing and he got a life changing opportunity with a company called Car Futures, which at the time was a subsidiary of uh, Credit Agricole in De Suez, which is a foreign bank that actually financed the Suez Canal, big bank. Um, and he was hired to set up their trading desk. They didn't do anything in equities. And so two weeks prior to 9-11, he took the job on the 92nd floor of the World Trade Center. And I should probably say that when he got the job offer, you know, we were jumping for joy. We had the champagne, the whole nine yards. Um, but I was hesitant because it was the 92nd floor of the World Trade Center. I'm like, you sure you want to do that? You sure? And of course, in typical Andy fashion, he's like, who thinks like you? Only you think like, like that. Like nobody thinks that way. Of course I'm gonna take it. I'm like, okay. Anyway, so now it's 9-11. I go to work that day um, and I was a regional manager for, again, it was Fleet Bank, but now it's Bank of America. And one of my branches was in Manhattan on Long Island. So I had a meeting with the branch manager there. I got there and prior to the meeting, uh, we were doing a conference call. My boss was in the city. He worked over by Grand Central Station and all the regional managers in the tri-state area were on the call, Connecticut, New Jersey, you know, sta um, the boroughs, all the different areas. And so about 10 of nine, to be exact, one of my friends who's still my dear friend, Maria Grasso gets on, gets on the phone and says, Lisa, doesn't Andy now work in the World Trade Center? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, he started two weeks ago. She said, you may want to get off the phone and, and put the TV on. And there's, there was an accident there. What happened? You know, plane hit the World Trade Center. I said, oh, I'm sure it's nothing. I'm sure it was just a puddle jumper or something. She's like, no, 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 you need to, you need to get off the phone. So my, the branch manager wheels a TV in, because again, this is prior to the technology. And I saw the first tower had been hit at that point, not the second tower. And of course, I, I don't even know what I was. I was in shock. I, I didn't know what to say. Um, and the, the biggest problem I had is that on the news, they kept saying the first tower and then they said the second tower. 
or the North Tower and the South Tower, but they never used the address. So if you were me, whose husband just started working there, all I knew was that he worked at One World Trade Center. I didn't know if it was North, South, First, or Second. 15 minutes goes by, and now it's about 9.15, the phone, my phone rings, and it says Jeffrey Nussbaum on my, the thing. I pick up the phone and it's Andy. So he had forgotten his phone, at work, you know, because back then it wasn't like, it wasn't glued to your side, you know? So he left his phone home that day and he borrowed a phone of one of his colleagues. And he said, we're all in a room and we have plenty of air. And I heard people coughing and kind of screaming in the background. And he, sound, he sounded in a typical Andy fashion, as cool as a cucumber. Now I'm watching this on the news and I see one, 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 one building is burning. What looked to me about right where he was, it looked about the 92nd floor because I knew the building was about 110 floors. The other building was lower. So this planes are like this. And I didn't know what to say to him because if I said one and he was in the South Tower that he would have been running into the fire. So I didn't say anything. I just said, I love you. I said nothing. I was, I was tongue tied. It was, it was, it was, had, I mean, I knew it was the last phone call I was going to get because he had already been in the building a half an hour, you know, from the time the first plane had hit. And in my mind, I'm like, if he could have gotten down, he would have gotten down. So I was smart enough to know that I didn't think he was getting down. So I, I just, I was frozen. So anyway, I called a friend to come get me because I couldn't drive. And um, while I'm not religious in any way, I said, we have to go to temple. I don't know why I said that. But in the meantime, I called the boys' school because they were uh, 11 at the time and they were in their second week of sixth grade. And then they'll tell the story after that. Um, and so I called the school to say, I spoke to their dad and their dad is fine. And I did that for a reason because I needed to buy time. I didn't know how to explain this to them. And I knew what, what, what my day was going to be, but I figured give me some time to get my thoughts together because I was freaking out. So I called the school, I told the school that, and then I went to temple and you know, the, the rabbi didn't know what to say to me. And by the time we got to temple, the second tower had fallen. So by then, you know, the first the South Tower fell, I wanted to say it was probably about 10 ish, and then by 1029, the second tower fell. So that was my morning. I mean, we will tell you more about how the week went. The boys can tell you a little bit about how their day went and then what we did that week to, to look for Andy. But I don't know, Mike, you wanna go next? Sure. <clears throat> so my son, my story, basically, I go back to the night before. Um, so one of the things that made our dad special was not just his love of life and not just the, the qualities about him, about putting others before himself, but he was a huge sports fan. He loved the Knicks. He loved the Giants. He loved the Yankees. And those are teams that we love even to this day. Well, I love, I love the Knicks maybe a little bit more than Dan does. And I'm not trying to be rude. I just, you know, I, <laughs> my brother's not an NBA fan as much as I am. But we were diehard Giants fans. We're diehard Yankees fans. And a lot of that, it was because of him. So the night before, um, it was Monday night football. The Giants were playing the Broncos. Now, this was the year after they had gone to the Super Bowl and got blown out by the Ravens. So... We have high expectations and dad had high expectations. And of course, in typical, I don't know if it was typical fashion, but to, to make things just interesting, they were getting blown out. And I don't remember exactly what he was, he was either eating or, or drinking because one of the things about uh, dad was whenever he'd watch big sporting games, the, the thing that was always common, he would have a big bottle of one liter, I think it was two liter uh, Coca-Cola. And he would have either these tuna roll-ups with, uh, with, with American cheese or, or chicken wings. Now, it would be one or the other. Right, it's good memory. <laughs> I remember him screaming at the TV saying, what the hell, why are we playing this awful? And there, it was a blowout. And unfortunately, because we were 11 years old and he had this, I don't know if it was a strict rule, but kind of this thing that, yeah, you got to go to bed. So Dan and I went to bed. And during that time, we didn't have a TV in our room. So we couldn't just, you know, sneak, sneak around and 
have the door shut and then just put the TV on and watch the rest of the game, even though we weren't supposed to. So that was the night before. And then the day of, you know, unfortunately, I couldn't say, you know, goodbye. I didn't say goodbye to him. I didn't get to say anything to him because he had he was going to work early that day. And Dan and I went to school and it was our second week of middle school. You know, so everything is new. Um, it's a new format of, of you just don't you don't go to one classroom and just sit there for five, six hours. You go to different classrooms and uh, it's, you know, first period, second period, third period. So everything was just new to us. I want to say this was my third period class. It was my English class. And it was a very small class. And mom, I've never told you this, but I got to be honest. During that time, I was bored out of my mind. There was this lecture <laughs> going kid. on. You and every other kid, I'm sure. Because yeah. <laughs> I was bored out of my mind. I was on the verge of falling asleep during the lecture. I probably would have gotten yelled at and whatnot. But, you know, I, I, stay, I, I was able to pay attention a little bit. So... A couple of minutes go by and then I see the, the principal comes in with one of his assistants, I believe. And they want to talk to me. Now, my first instinct was, what, what, did I do something wrong? I've only been in school for over a week. So what, <laughs> how can I, I be getting in trouble? What did I do? So the principal takes me outside and he based, and he explains to me that two planes had just hit the World Trade Center. And your dad is in the building. He's doing fine. He has plenty of air. Your mom spoke to him. And we just wanted to let you know that that is the situation, but he's doing good. And you just, she just told you, just keep on going with your day. And if anything changes, we will let you know. And I said, okay. And I go back into the classroom and I just felt something was off. And even as an 11 year old, I still, you know, it just amazed me how, just, yeah, something just wasn't right. So I remember my teacher was looking at me and she saw this puzzled, confused look on my face. And she said to me, you know, she asked if she wanted to speak and she said, is everything okay? And I told her the situation and I told her what was going on. And the other thing was that there weren't TVs in our school. So we weren't, I wasn't just going to go ahead and get a remote and put on the news and find out what, what's going on. So the interesting thing about this was the only two people that, well, that I know of that knew what, what was going on were obviously Dan and I. I don't believe anyone else in school knew. So when about our day, we get to our last period of the day before we go home. And it's one of my favorite subjects, it's global history. And I'm sitting there and there's an announcement over the speaker that I need to go, go to the front and because there's someone here to pick me up. And it was an old family friend of ours. So I'm there, I see, I see Dan, and our family friend takes us, takes us from the school to their house. And basically we just had a play date with, um, it was her son and another old friend of ours. And we, we went swimming, we had dinner, everything just seemed to be normal. Until you got home. Until, they took us home after dinner. So we get home and I see cars, a lot of cars there. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, what is going on? Something that just isn't right. So the first thing I noticed is when I got into the house, I saw, I saw my mom. She just gave us a big hug and just told us she loved us. And, but the, and then I asked, I asked her, I said, where's dad? And you know, I don't remember what you said, mom. You know what, I'm trying to, I, I don't, you would remember this maybe more than me. Did you come to Temple? There was, there no. was about, about 1500 people. So the, you you didn't come home until later that night because yeah. um, they had a service, you know, a prayer service at Temple. And I went, I went with like a lot of, it was tons of people, we all went there. And then the other piece of what happened that night is your father's car was at, um, and I don't know if you know this either, his car was at Hicksville Station because he- You did, you did tell me that. And so our friend, Chuck Berlin, had to take the extra key and go bring the car home. So he took the key with the alarm and walked around the Hicksville Station to go find the car. But anyway, you must have gotten home later. It must've been closer to 10 o'clock at night because we yeah. were in services. I don't know what I told, I don't remember what I told you. I know there were no TVs on in the house. 
Um, I don't know, Dan, why don't you pick it up from here and kind of- oh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, before, before I, I, I'm sorry, Dan, I just wanted to just mention one other quick thing. Um, yeah, I don't remember for in I, don't particular, even, I don't know what I said. What you said. What I do remember is we went home, we did our homework, and we went yeah. to bed. And we thought we were gonna get up and go to go to school. I mean, I'm sure we said at the time, I, I'm sure we didn't say that you know, we we figured it was a recovery effort. So we said, you know, there's hope that dad'll be home and and let's we're gonna we're gonna go with that, with that, with that uh you know, feeling until someone proves us wrong. Now, well, in my heart of hearts, I knew he wasn't. Coming. Yeah, the one thing, the thing that I remember is, so just to give you guys a little background, in our house, we named certain rooms after the color of the house. So we had the pink room, which which we called the, which obviously was a computer room. We had the green room, which was our one of our living rooms. And we had this, red, we had a red room that had a lot of um, different uh, family, you know, mem memorabilia and a little small TV that our dad used to tape stuff for us. And I remember the following morning that Dan and I, were, we got up and we weren't going to school. And we were saying, why aren't we going to school? So we sat in the, we sat on a couch there and you came in and you told us the, uh, which was probably the hardest thing that anybody could ever do was tell your kids that your dad may not ever come home, which was probably the most difficult thing that any parent would ever tell their kids. And then it finally hit me and said, wow. Yeah, I, well, there's more to that because we went looking for your father. I mean, we didn't know that yet. It wasn't until probably 10 days later when we had the memorial service that we actually made the decision that, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell that after. Dan, why don't you go and then I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap that up. Yeah, so the, uh, just to sort of piggyback off what Mike was saying about the night before 9-11 and talking about games, you know, one of the things that I remember from growing up with our dad um, was that when we couldn't stay up um, for a, a late night sporting event, whether it was the Yankees or the Giants, whoever it might be, and he told us to go to bed beforehand, before the end of the game, he would always write a note um, with the score of the game so that when we wake up, we would see the note and see what happened. And it would be the first thing we'd see it would be his handwriting and his, his notes on whatever happened in the game. Um, Good memory. I don't recall if on 9-11 um, there was a note about the Giants because it was such a blowout and because we kind of figured that the Giants were gonna lose that game anyway. But uh, I'd like to think that he left a note that morning, even with the score. So I, know, I remember you said goodbye to him. You, I heard. I remember that specifically for some reason. I I have no recollection of that. It definitely could have happened. I I I don't remember. There are a lot of things I don't remember about that day because a lot of it is a blur. But I'll I'll sort of tell it the way that I saw it, on um, the way that I heard it. Um, so very similar to Mike and how he explained it. Uh, we were starting at the at a new middle school, second week, new lockers, new formats, everything. I remember also being in English class. And I, I remember this English class specifically because um, one of our summer reading assignments was one of the Harry Potter books that had just started to come out. <laughs> I remember part of it, this is, our dad didn't really, he wasn't really into like fantasy books. He wasn't into these things, um, at least not that I knew of. And um you know, we watched so much sports with him. We play, we, we spent so much time outside and playing games and sports and, you know, reading was not as big a thing for us uh, growing up. And, um, and so I didn't like Harry Potter. Um, I just remember not enjoying being in English class and looking for any sort of out, not like bored out of my mind the way Mike describes it, but just looking for some something else to, 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 to take my attention. I was always a math kid growing up and I was looking forward to math class that day and science and those kind of classes. But anyway, in the second period English, um, principal comes in and tells us, or says he wants to speak to me outside and says, you know, a plane had hit your dad's building. I don't recall that he used the name World Trade Center in that conversation because quite frankly, I didn't really know what the World Trade Center was. Um, I knew that our dad worked in the city. I knew that our mom worked on Long Island. I knew that they were both in banking and finance, but that's kind of about all I knew. 
Um, I didn't know anything about the World Trade Center, didn't know much about the city, to be to be frank. And so he said a plane hit our dad's building. And because he said he was fine and because I held our dad in such high regard, you know, very much like a Superman type of person, I didn't think much of it. I'll be honest. I kind of went about my day kind of normally. I didn't, I never felt off. I felt like it was just a normal day at that point. Then we get to the last period of the day and get the announcement that I'm supposed to take my things and then go to the front and where our friend and his mom were going to, were, were picking us up. Um, and they just said, we're going for a play date. And I was like, cool. I'm getting out of school early. I'm, I'm happy. Like this is, this is cool. So I get to, I get to spend the day, you know, having fun. I, I, I didn't think I never made the connection until many years later that this was sort of a, a, a distraction ploy by our mom. Um, at the time as an 11 year old who had been in school and, you know, I'm in the middle of history class and I don't particularly enjoy history class. I'm just happy to I get did. out. <laughs> I'm just happy to get out. Um, so we go to our friend's house, have a play date, go swimming, eat dinner very much as Mike described. Um, and I don't remember what time it was that we just, that we finally went home and saw all the cars. And then for the next, you know, two or three days, I have no memory of, I have zero memory of, of, of specific, I'm, 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 I'm sure you do, but I, I don't have any specific memories from the Im immediately getting home or I just remember the line of cars and that's kind of where my memory goes blank. And um, it wasn't until much later in the week that my memory starts to pick up and us going to the city because that's where my memory starts to pick up um, when we were quote unquote looking for dad. Um, but I don't, I don't- Well, you can, any... you can take that. I, I'll just interrupt and just say that, you know, I didn't know how to handle it. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know the right way to, um, you talk to the kids because we were living in a gray area. And so I spoke to a child psychologist and I said, what do I do? And she gave me some wonderful advice, which we now give, we do a lot of public speaking, me and the boys, and we speak to other people that are going through traumatic loss and whatnot. And the, the advice she gave me is she said, you never want to feel like a victim. She said, when you turn your energy, when it's, when it's all about yourself, it, it, it's difficult, you become, it's all about me. She said, you need to push it outward and, and really make it become about we. She said, let the kids feel like they're participating in something that has to do with what's going on. So I thought about it and I said, what could we do? So I don't know if you all remember, everybody made those flyers that, you know, and they, we posted them on all the walls around the city and my in-laws actually had to go get the DNA tests. Um, so what we did is I, I, we made the flyers and Dan and Mike and myself and a very dear friend of mine that lived on the Upper East Side, as Dan said, we didn't know, they didn't know uptown from downtown. So we kind of faked them out and we, 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 we put together a route all around the Upper East Side to all the firehouses, police stations, Lenox Hill Hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital. But Dan, tell her what Lori did and, and what we, you know, cause that's like kind of what was unique about what we did. Yeah, so, you know, in I, I, my guess on what day this was, this was probably Friday. 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 Yeah, Friday. That, that's what I remember, because I don't remember anything about Wednesday and Thursday. I, I have zero memory of that. But Friday, I remember being in kind of like a van or a minivan van. Van. and being in New York City. I thought we were downtown, because um, again, the only times we'd ever been to the city at that point were for shows or ball games. Uh, we never really spent that much time, you know, going out in the city or really discovering the city. So I didn't know uptown from downtown. We didn't know uptown from downtown. Uh, we thought we were by ground zero is where we thought we were. Um, but we remember very vividly, you know, putting together little care packages for the first responders, for the people who we thought were the, the people going into the rubble and going into the pile. Um, so we put together little care packages, you know, different supplies. You know, one of the things that we very vividly remember, which will come sort of full circle later on, was that package included clean and dry socks because we would hear about how for people that would go into the rubble, their feet would get wet and dirty um, and they needed socks. And that was something that, that the first responders needed. So we put together packages with socks. And so that, that sort of represented hope for our family. 
um, I remember the, the flyer very vividly, um, the picture of dad with his arms around my shoulders. I remember that photo. Um, and if you have any information, you know, call this number, putting them all over the city, giving them out. And that night, I don't, I don't remember exactly what happened. And I, my memory sort of don't pick up for another sort of week or week and a half when we did the memorial service at the temple. Right. Um, right. Well, the next day was, was Rosh Hashanah. That it was. was. Okay. And we went to temple and it was a nightmare for me anyway. You know, it was, it was hard. You know, everybody was there. It, we were the only family that was affected that had young kids in the community um, by 9-11. Um, the Syosset schools, there was, there was one other family that had older children that were already out of, the, out of the high school. And the other family, the children were so young they hadn't started in elementary school yet. So in terms of kids in the community, they were the only two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, the attention and, and the questions, and it was just like we were in, you know, it was really hard. And my in-laws, I felt so bad for them because I, I knew I wanted to kind of, I, I knew it wasn't good for the boys to live in a gray space. You, you know, it, it's got to be black or white. You know, kids have to know their father, their father's either coming home or he's not. This, this maybe stuff wasn't, wasn't working for them. And so the psychologist told me I needed to call it. So when we came home from Temple that day, I had a conversation with grandma, which was my, you know, my husband's mother. And, you know, much against her wishes, I told the boys that Andy had died because we figured that if he came home, we'd celebrate. But we needed to, because they would come home, you wouldn't remember this, but you kept coming home and you kept calling one 800 Red Cross and saying, did you find him? Did you find him? They were like perseverating on it. It was too much, you know? Anyway, so that's kind of, that's kind of what happened. We had a, a very large memorial service on September 21st. Over 2000 people came, the police had to come. And you know, the temple was set up for the high holidays. And so there, were, there was enough seating for, you know, thousands of people. It was, it was, it was crazy. And the boys actually um, did a, um, I didn't, I didn't say anything because I was, I was holding them. They were holding me up, I think. I don't remember. I was on a lot of drugs. <laughs> to be honest, I don't know what the, I was a little out of it. Hey, you guys did a, uh, um, a eulogy and a lot of friends did a, a lot of different things. And um, yeah. And then let's see, it wasn't until- um, I wanted to mention one yeah. quick thing that um, yeah. I think changed a lot of, there was a lot of things that were changing. And one of those things was my, was, you know, for me. So uh, nobody knows this obviously, except for the three of us, but mom knows this. Mom, how much of a pain in the, you know, what was I when I went to the dentist? And oh yeah. Well, it, you know, it's interesting. This is again, something very interesting for, that you learn about kids and, 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 um, and so Mike had, um, he had some tactile issues where he was, a, you know, when people touched him and he did, he, he wouldn't get his braces on. I mean, we had spent. Wasn't braces. It was a pallet expander. Well, that was, it's braces. It was the orthodontist, but anyway. Um, and you know, for, for years we had gone to the, to the orthodontist because he would spend the day with the, with the orthodontist was very patient. And he would let Mike watch him do it to other kids that eventually he would, you know, acquiesce to the concept. Anyway, to make a long story short, he marched into my room and he said, you know, I have been a real pain in the neck to you for all these years. And I'm, I'm you know, I don't want to cause you any more stress. Than you. I mean, this is just how out of the mouths of babes, you know, and your moms, you understand this. Um, he said, I'm ready. And my mom took him and he marched right in there and opened his mouth. Well, and that was it. A couple things that were missing from that that I remember. The first thing was when I went into the orthodontist that day, that was a really the first time I broke down emotionally. Yeah. It really was. I, I, I wasn't I, there. Well, I know. I know. But I, I broke down emotionally. So that's when I first realized. I, I at first re That was when it really hit me that dad, I was never going to see dad again. And it was tough. It was so hard. It was so painful. Um. But, you know, I give credit to the dentist, to the, the assistants there. They kept me, they kept me calm. 
And I go into the, it was actually, it wasn't in the main room. It was in the, it was actually in one, the, one of the uh, doctor's offices that I went into. They did the procedure. They put the pallet expander in. And my grandma was so happy. Nana was so happy. What you didn't know is that actually she told me, if you do this, I'll, I'll take you to the baseball card shop and get you an autograph. Of course, of course she did. <laughs> Bribery That's will get you I everywhere. <laughs> but no, but anyway. all, 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 all kidding aside, um, you're, you're right. You guys were the best. I have to say, Mike and Dan were real champs. I mean, they, they were so worried about me that they, you really, you really, and we all really came together. We were like a team, you know, we just, we made it work. It wasn't easy, but we made it work. It was, it was, I finally got you a TV in your room. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember that. Yeah, so I did that. A, a couple a couple of things I'll add. Um, <laughs> I'm going to just go get a tissue. You guys keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a couple of things I'll add to that. Um, number one, the the eulogy was without a doubt that's when it really hit me having to write that well that's when it really like hit home for me that was my moment of like realization that I had to write all about our dad being this amazing person but in the back of my mind I had to write it from the fact that he was never coming home like I could I could wax poetic about my dad you know my entire life but always with the thought that, you know, he might hear it, he'll, he'll see it, and then we'll, we'll hang out that night or whatever. And this is the first time I ever had to, like, had to say something really, really nice about him. And he wouldn't hear it or he wouldn't be able to respond and he wouldn't be able to, to, to come home after. So that was when it hit me. Um, I do remember, you know, when Mike, Mike and Mom brought up, you know, the TV in our room afterwards. And part of that was... it. it, it it probably kept us, you know, a little more secluded to our rooms at the time. Um, but that was also the time when the Yankees were in the World Series again. Um, and I remember watching it on that TV in our room and, you know, having that as a nice distraction and having the team that our dad loved so much and the team that he brought us up to, to, to watch and the team that, you know, brought us such joy as kids um, and so many shared memories to see them in the world series after 9-11 was a really great distraction from everything that was going on um you can I tell do, that story dan the whole derek jeter story yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, i'll get to that in a second but i i remember when they lost in game seven and i just remember that being sort of like all right this distraction is over now what this was this was that was the time when i was like okay dad's not home Yankees lost we're all in a bad mood it's dark in the house it's nighttime now what and that that was kind of the the beginning of the rest of our life I guess um because from 9-11 through I guess that was the beginning of November that the, that time was such a blur so many things happening back and forth in the family so many things so many people coming, so many people are reaching out and organizations and, and friends and family and it's just it's such a whirlwind. And that night I remember after game seven and it all being dark, that was like kind of like, we're all just taking a deep breath and then we're gonna sort of move on with the rest of our lives at that point. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that our dad really instilled in us growing up was giving back to others and paying it forward and doing the right thing. And, both mom and our dad were, were staunch proponents of, of helping out those less fortunate. So one of the things that we did as kids, Mike and I, uh, when we would get our, our, our weekly allowance, we would set aside a portion of that and, and donate it to charity, you know, to, the, to sort of fulfill that, that meaning of paying it forward and doing the right thing. And because we were such Yankees fans, we decided to donate the money to Derek Jeter's charity, Turn Two. And I remember when we raised over a hundred dollars from our allowance, I wrote a really nice letter to Derek Jeter um, saying that we saved up from our allowance and saying that, you know, this, this was because our dad taught us, our mom taught us. And so we were, we were very fortunate to give or felt honored to give to, to his charity. And I believe we got a note back from his dad who, I don't know if he was running the charity or just very involved. And we got a really nice note from his dad thanking us for the donation. 
Now, post 9-11, I think, Mom, you're in a good position to sort of pick up the story from here about how yeah. that's, that, that, that correspondence continued. Yeah, so um, I knew Derek because he was the spokesperson for Fleet Bank. And at the time, uh, there was a commercial, I don't know if you'd remember it, it was uh, Omar Garcia Parr from, from Boston. And Omar. No more, sorry. And they did, uh, they bantered back and forth about online banking. Anyway, so because of the relationship that he had with Fleet, um, we used to do a lot of different fundraising events with him and wrapping gifts for kids and, and whatnot. So that day, his mother called my boss and said, Jeff, is, are all your employees okay? Because she knew that we had branches down on Church Street and a couple on Broadway and whatnot. And Jeff said to him, said to her, you know, Dot, um, actually the employees were all fine, but I don't know if you remember those two kids that they gave you guys the money, um, their father's missing. So um, she immediately must have gone to Derek and Derek wrote the boys a very quick letter. And actually I spoke to her, but I spoke to her about her daughter was also going through chemotherapy at the time and I had gone through chemo. So we had another connection through that horror. But um, anyway, she wrote a note to the, he wrote a note to the boys and invited them to a Christmas party and to um, when, when, when in the spring, when it was opening day, they were able to go and sit in the front row. You know, he just, he, he, he um, embraced them very nicely as did everybody. I, you know, the amount, the amount of people and communities and different organizations that kind of picked us up and carried us over the cloud including, you know, Tuesday's Children, which we'll talk about in a minute, and, and Federation, and the Red Cross. I was a spokesman for the Red Cross um, with Senator, uh, uh, Wall oh, what the heck was his name? Oh, shoot, I'm having a scene from Maine. Can't think of it. Anyway, it was called the Liberty Fund because so many people had given money. I got involved with Hillary Clinton and with Governor Pataki because there was something called the United Services Group. People. They, and you know, because I was savvy with money, they, they chose me as a, as, a, as a liaison to the families and to the charities because I could kind of speak the language. I understood what people needed, but um, you know, I was okay and I was able, you know, I worked. So I was able to take care of my family and whatnot. But anyway, I got very involved in, in the charities as did the kids. I guess there's just one other story we can tell you and then we'll kind of segue to where we are now. But um, they found uh, it was, it was right after the boys bar mitzvah. The boys were bar mitzvah in May of uh, 2003. And we called it the trilogy because there was th very good friends and all of our children got, uh, got bar mitzvah. Dan and Mike were, were May 17th, the following week was another kid. And then I believe it's June 1st was the third kid. So that was the trilogy. On the second, which was a Monday, I'm in the kitchen uh, on the phone with a friend who also lost her husband and the, there's a knock at the door and I go get the door and it is a New York City police officer. And he came to tell us that they had found some of my husband's remains. Now, again, when my kids were 11, I didn't tell them that we didn't bury dad. You know, I, it was too complicated to explain it to a child. It was too complicated for an adult to wrap their head around it. So I just didn't, we didn't talk about it. So now they're 13 and we have some remains, not all, and so we did have a funeral. And again, at the time, I think you guys assumed we buried daddy, but we really didn't. We just buried remains. Um, and then fast forward to recently when they built the memorial and the museum, we were there the day after it opened. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever been there, um, Shelly, but behind the, um, the enameled, um, there's a big, um, what do you call it? Um, piece of art, I guess, an enameled wall. And behind there is the repository where they, um, where they, where they house all of the, um, the remains of the people that they haven't identified yet and whatnot. So um, after, after Andy's funeral, my mother and I, my mother-in-law and I both decided that we were gonna sign our rights away that we didn't want to be called every 15 minutes when they found another body part because it was just, it was too, it was too hard. And that's what we had done. But now, you know, now it must've been about 2014 or 2015, you guys were in your twenties. Um, and they built the memorial and we were there and my mother-in-law had passed by now. 
I got this weird feeling. So we were there and they let us into the repository. It's only open to family members. And we walked in and I just knew he was there. So I called and I said, you know, can you let us know, you know, if there's any of my husband's remains there? And as it turns out, there are. So now the kids are 24, 25, whatever. So we sat down as adults and had a family conversation and, you know, out of the mouths of babes again, you know, you guys are the ones that said to me, you know, mom, so millions of people visit daddy down at the World Trade Center. And, you know, we don't go to the, go to the cemetery all that often. Let him rest in peace. Let, there'll always be a pieces of him floating around in New York anyway. So leave him alone. So yeah, so my husband is, is at the, which, which makes me happy that so many people go and visit. And, and also the other thing I should say is we were very involved in the building of the, um, of the memorial. I was one of the first families. I was one of the first people that went representing the family um, to the World Trade Center. And so they used my vignette, my voice talking about Andy when they did all of the fundraising. So um, um, her name was uh, Levin. Uh, I can't think of her first name either right now, but um, Kate Levin. Kate Levin was the one, she's, she works for Mayor Bloomberg for his foundation. And so she was the one that went to Mobile and to Goldman Sachs and to you know all the big FedEx and to all the big corporations to raise money to build the museum. And it wasn't until many, many years later, I was giving a speech at Seven World Trade Center at Silverstein Properties. Um, and she was in the audience and she heard my voice and she came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I had your voice in my pocket for five years straight raising money. It was your story, it was Andy, which made me feel so good that like everybody now in the world knows about Andy Friedman, it's kind of cool. <laughs> what we didn't talk about is the fact that Mike and Dan are extraordinarily tall. So Mike is 6'11", Dan is six foot nine. And um, I was at a fundraiser back in like 1999 and I met um, Magic Johnson. And he wrote on, and I told him I had these big ball players and they play basketball and blah, blah, blah. And he wrote on his, um, on his autograph picture to the Twin Towers, best of luck, you know, magic. And so that name sort of stuck. The boys were always the Twin Towers. Every basketball game, they always put them in together, you know, to do, for defense or whatever. <laughs> they were the Twin Towers, which, you know, is kind of a, a bit of sad irony, frankly, that, you know, years later, that's where their father was killed. But um, anyway, you guys want to, Dan, you want to, you want to take it now? You know, a couple of pieces of the puzzle um, that sort of were set around 9-11 that sort of came full circle when we got older. Um, you know, one of the organizations that, that came to our aid when we were younger was Tuesday's Children, which was formed in the aftermath of 9-11. It had started in the community of Manhasset or Plan Dome, and because they had lost so many people there. Um, this organization's nonprofit was started really to assist the families and the kids specifically of 9-11. Um, they helped us to make us feel like we weren't alone in going through all this. They, they connected us with other families. They hosted different you know, events, you know, sort of a mock take your kid to work day, even though our, our dad wasn't able to take us. They'd get people in the community, different media organizations, business leaders to, to take on the politicians, to take on these kids, um, to, to sort of take your kid to work day to, to help them out. Um, as we got older, they would assist with things like resume writing and, and college application help. Um, but again, really sort of this sense of community to never let us feel alone. I know they also helped out mom with grief counseling and services, uh, psychological services. So they were really a great organization that, that came to our aid. And we always thought it was a quote, tall order to, to give back to them um, for all the assistance that they gave us. Now I mentioned earlier in the story that socks always represented hope for our family I and mean, giving them out to, to the first responders or giving them out to people we thought were first responders after 9-11. Um, combine this sort of the, these puzzle pieces with the fact that both Mike and I were, were kind of struggling internally with our lack of ability to, to give back at our jobs in corporate America. We've been work, we've been out of college for about five years at that point. And 
both working big corporate jobs and both of us were, neither of us were, were happy about our ability, our lack of ability to feel like we were making a direct impact, a tangible impact in the way that our, our, our dad taught us to do. So you've got the, the socks, you've got the lack of ability to give back. There's always that innate desire to, to give back to Tuesday's children and to other impactful organizations. This was also the time when people were really personalizing themselves with their socks. People were, were getting into the fun, funky patterns and personalizing and you know, more colorful options. And the fact is because Mike and I are so tall, we do the majority of our shopping at big and tall stores. And we quite frankly couldn't find uh, the, the, these fun and funky socks that, that our, our friends were wearing. We got very jealous. You know, you'd go to big and tall stores You'd find a lot of plain blues, plain browns, plain grays, maybe a stripe or an argyle every now and then. But when you'd find something with a pattern, they wouldn't fit very well. They tear very easily. You, you, you'd see a lot of loose threads on the inside of the socks, um, and that would provide more opportunities to, to tear open throughout the day. They would slide down. They just, they just weren't comfortable. So... When you put in all of these pieces together, this is how you can start to see how the, the seeds of a business were sown. And so in 2017, our family, we launched Tall Order, you know, really in that vein of, of that tall order to give back. Um, and we've started by producing socks for guys of all sizes. You know, we're not just for big and tall, although we do carry lots of larger sizes for guys like us and for any guy with a big foot who, or with an odd shaped foot who doesn't fit into standard size socks. Um, so we go from sizes nine to 20 for men. Um, and we donate a portion of our profits back to Tuesday's children as our main charity partner. And then as we go all over the country, pre as we did pre COVID and now we do it virtually um, to different um, markets that are put on by philanthropic organizations, we donate a portion of our sales back to them too. And we, we've raised tens of thousands of dollars for, for Tuesday's children, um, for the Feel Good Foundation. I know you've had John Feel on in the past and we did a collaboration with him. Mom's got the Feel Good sock. She's showing it right now. Mm -hmm. um, so when we launched that, we, um, we, we set, initially set to donate 50% of the proceeds of that to John Feel and his organization, um, because we know that he is doing such great work with the 9-11 first responders community, and especially with all of the medical hardships that they're facing, uh, even to this day, as a result of the heroic acts that they did. Now, since COVID happened, um, and since he got COVID, and a lot of other first responders who have felt an increased sickness because of their pre-existing conditions and those that have suffered from COVID, we now donate 100% of the proceeds from the sales of the Feel Good Sock back to the Feel Good Foundation. So we're really proud of that collaboration. Um, but really we are just, we're, we're, we're proud that we are doing something that not only that our dad would love because he finally have great socks that fit, um, we're now starting to branch into to other categories where we're getting into more athletic wear, um, we've, we just introduced some low cut socks for running and for, 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 for summer days. Um, <laughs> and, and, then, and then we'll be coming out with no shows for the summer. We'll be coming out with underwear and t-shirts. So we were doing, we're, we, we, our goal is kind of the top drawer for all. So I know our dad would be proud that he would have a lot of great things that fit because he was a big guy. Um, mm -hmm. Although I'd be really interested to see how he would feel with, with both Mike and I towering over him today. Uh, but we're also proud of, of what we're doing and what we're giving back to the organization that helped us out. And I think it's really important to note um, that our logo is, is formed from a T and an O for Tall Order, has a subtle nod to the World Trade Center, but it's also in sky blue, um, which represents the clear blue sky on 9-11. And we put it on the ankle of every sock and it'll be visible on the underwear and the t-shirts. There's our logo. Um, and the real sort of impetus uh, behind the, the design of that logo is that the T rises above the O with the World Trade Center to show that we can rise above tragedy, um, to show how we can triumph and that, you know, together we can, we can, we can accomplish great things. And, you know, with the help of community and with the help of, of friends, family, and the help of great organizations, you know, no matter how daunting the odds seem, 
you know, we can come and we can rise above it. And so we put that, that logo on the ankle of every sock and on every piece of clothing that we make just to remind people of that tall order and not only to serve as a conversation starter, but to remind the people that are wearing them to fill their own personal tall order in their everyday life and to do something nice for, for other people and to pay it forward, even if that's you not know, buying someone a cup of coffee or, or helping someone out in any, in whatever fashion that takes, you know, we, we've always thought it was a tall order to pay it forward and do the right thing. And so we want to inspire other people to do that. And I'm very happy to say from the, the countless emails we've, we've received from customers, from, from, from friends, from, from strangers, that I think we're, we're, we're doing a great job of, of promoting that mission. I know your father is smiling. <laughs> I I'm know crying. your father <laughs> is smiling. What an inspiring story. That's just incredible. Now, I, I have a strange, it may sound like a strange question to ask you. Yeah. And all of you can answer individually. Do you ever feel him with you? Are there specific moments when you feel him with you? Can you tell us about that? Um, I don't know if there's anything specific, but what I will say is, you know, because to me, he's, I feel he's with me every day. Everything that I do in life, everything that I've tried, that I try to do, I, it's in reflection of him. So when I'm giving back or I'm, I'm doing things that I know he would want me to do, I feel that for him. And I'll give an example. Um, you know, Dan right now is doing a, um, I think it's, what is it? Five, it was, well, it's, it was doing something for the 9-11 Memorial, doing his own uh, personal uh, goal of, how many miles are you trying to do, Dan? So I started the, the challenge on, on uh, February 25th. The 9-11 Memorial Museum is having their, their virtual uh, um, 5k or they're ver now they're trying to do you know a collective 20,000 miles I'm I'm personally trying to do 200 miles between February 25th and April 25th of running and uh, as I reached yesterday I reached the quarter of the way there so over 50 miles down 150 to go so uh. so those are the things you know that um are in me and more importantly in our family that he's he's proud of it you know I've been I'm thankful that I've been able to donate to that. And I know mom's the same way. And I know how much that would make dad proud. And then I would hope that would make Dan proud, but you know, it's sometimes it's not the easiest to impress him, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but yeah, the, the thing is, is that he's with us all the time when we're, when we're up or when we're, when we're down and we need something to kind of boost us and guide us, we know he's there and he's looking on, he's looking out for us and, I'm just thankful that um, I got to learn a lot from somebody I call, I called my hero, my role model, my coach, and everything I do now, you know, through, you know, now and hopefully for the rest of my life, I do it for him. And I'm thankful for that. And I love him and I miss him. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that there are necessarily specific moments when, I feel he's with me because he's with me every day and whether it's in the hobbies that we take up, whether it's in the teams that we root for, the, the music that we like, the, the, the things that we do on everyday basis, you know, there's always a little piece of him that, that that's with us. Um, I think it's interesting now that, you know, our family, we do, we do a lot of public speaking all over the country. Um, for a lot of great organizations and telling our story. And, you know, we get to share our story. And every time we, we talk about it, it, just, I feel like I learn a little something new, not only about myself, but also about dad. And I learn a little bit more. And, and I know we've heard our mom give a very similar speech to a number of organizations, but e even with like that similar text, I feel like, you know, he's with us, guiding us through those speeches and, 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 and He's always making a presence where, wherever we're, we're, we're trying to spread our mission and trying to, to share our story with others. So, you know, he's with us every single day. I, I, I keep a photo of him close by every day. Um, I have a little artifact from 
uh, some of the steel from the World Trade Center. So I, 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 not a day goes by where I don't look at that. It's next to the photo of my dad. It's in my background there. It's just, it can be hard to tell, but it's there. Um, so there's not a day goes by where I don't think about him. But at the same time, you know, I don't, I try not to often think, you know, what, what if, what if this hadn't happened and how would our lives be different? Because right now this is the only life I know and this is the life I've, we've chosen to lead. And, um, you know, I think he'd be very proud of what we're doing. I think he'd be proud of the type of people that Mike and I are and the, the way that our mom has really bounced back resiliently. And um, I know that, that our mom will, will talk a little bit about sort of the postscript and, you know, kind of the way that the dad shows up in everyday life, just in your personal life too. Yeah. So I, for me, I mean, I, I'm a little bit more, um, I believe in, you know, the afterlife a little bit and, and, and people visiting and whatnot. And I have had some strange situations that have happened where Andy was clearly there. And, you know, there, there's so many of them. I, I wouldn't even begin to, you know, tell you all of them, but you know, it's things like, you know, um, when, when you least expect it, one of them was, you know, um, I was driving, we were driving and there was a restaurant called Andrews and on the radio was Ripple, the song Ripple by the Grateful Dead. Uh, Andy was a huge deadhead. And so when we built a park, we built a basketball court in his memory right after 9-11 that summer, the kids, the kids in the neighborhood all raised money. My bank, which was Fleet Bank gave us money. And all together, it was $68,000. We donated it to the town and they built a beautiful state-of-the-art basketball court because Andy used to always bit complain about the fact that the basketball court in the neighborhood, the kids would throw the ball up and it would roll down the hill and he would play. He was a big basketball player. Anyway, so um, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, plaque. Thank you. The plaque that is in the garden by the basketball court. It says, you know, donated by the friends and family and children of the community, blah, blah, blah. And then the, the quote that we used was from Ripple, if I knew the way I would take you home. And so here I am driving by Andrews and Ripple comes on. <laughs> Stuff like that is weird. We were, we were out to dinner actually, you guys were with us. And it was a couple of years back, we were sitting in the Oyster Bay Clam Bar and the guy, there was a guitar player. It was the end of the season. It was the last night they were gonna be open. It was the last song of the last night and it was the day before 9-11. It was a Sunday night and he, his last song is Ripple. Like those are the times that I think Andy's with us. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, it has to be, right? It has to be. Um, so yeah, so Daniel was gonna, you know, the, the, the epilogue to the story is, you know, after I went back to work, kids went back to school. We tried to create some sort of normalcy in our life. I met um, my now who I've been married to for 15 years. I met Bruce Clark, who at the time was um, a sports producer for ABC Sports, which now I have these, you know, sports fanatics in my house. And I bring home this guy who is the producer for the Michigan game and the USC game and the uh, you know, I don't know all the other teams that he, you know, whatever, but all the, all the big guys, like Texas, the Olympics, the um... Olympics, they were like, you know, you know, how most kids like their mom brings someone home and there's a lot of friction and this and that they like threw me aside, <laughs> they charged them. And so it has been such a blessing for all of us to have Bruce in our life. And what another thing we talk about, and, and, and you might've heard this and, and I, I didn't, I didn't make this up. Another woman, another widow did it. it it's all about the fact that when you lose somebody, you know, people always say, you, you know, move on. You never move on, you move forward. And the person who you've lost, whether it's your parents, whether it's your spouse, whoever it is, are on your side. They're, they're standing beside you because they're who make you who you are. So when Bruce married me, he married me, he married Daniel, he married Michael, he married Andy, he's there. <laughs> He's part of it. Not literally Dan and I, but you know. You know what I mean. He just, it's just that, you know, you move forward and the people that you've lost help create who you are. And um, so Bruce has been the, just a wonderful addition to our family. He's, he's taken over where, you know, and where Andy left off with the sports 
And at the, you know, when the boys were younger, I used to take them to the sugar bowl and the orange bowl and the this bowl and the that bowl. But um, he is their best friend and he's my best friend too. And we're just really blessed, you know. I always often say to my girlfriends that I have a very good picker. So if you if you're if you know of any single women or men, I do a good job of matchmaking because I know how to pick good guys. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to mention one other thing uh, yeah. that, about um, about her question about um, it's not we didn't just talk. We talked about the sports. We talked about, you know, his idea of giving back. Another thing that he loved was food. He loved oh, it. Yeah. And one tradition that we do every year on the day of 9-11, no matter where we are, we, we always get home. We always go to Peter Luger's in Brooklyn because that was his favorite sure. restaurant. And yes, every, every year, we were, even were able to do it this year during the pandemic, last year during the pandemic, although we, we went outside and make sure we were socially distant. Um, we went out, we, we were able to sit there and tell stories about him. And we, we, we would go with his very close friend, Stewie Grumman, who happens to have, have a sock name after him, the Stewie, um, on our website, tallorder.com. And <laughs> it's just a really a good way just to honor him because that was who he was. And it's, you know, we do it every year and it's something I'm very proud. It's one of those traditions I'm very proud of and very thankful for. Um, not just for the fact they get to enjoy a good steak. <laughs> it's to really celebrate his life um, on a day where we could be sulking and crying and, you know, thinking, why isn't he here? We, you know, we, we really, we, that was one thing because exactly. he wasn't a downer. You know, Andy, like I said, you know, he was with me when I had ovarian cancer and he wouldn't let me get down. And he was like, we're going to go out. We're going to celebrate. You're well, you're, you know, we're not going to think about the fact that you were sick. We're going to think about the fact that you've got a future now. And I am, I'm 36 years off of chemotherapy now. So he, he was right, you know, but anyway, um, even the year, the year right after 9-11, we, we, we always went out on, most people went down and read the names and this and that. We didn't do that. We spent the day doing whatever we would normally do. And then we'd go out and go to some of his favorite restaurants and just kick back and have fun. Cause that would be what he would want us to be doing. So. Well, I'm just so honored that you shared this whole story. It's beautiful and touching and most of all, inspiring and so heartfelt and warming. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Oh, you're so Thank welcome. You. Thank you so much.